On this episode of AI's Corner Office with Aviso, we're joined by Brian Gumbel, newly appointed president and COO at Dataminer, and Aviso AI CEO Trevor Rodriguez Templar. Brian Trevor, Stanford University's new 2024 AI index had some interesting findings. The global survey on responsible AI highlighted that companies' top AI-related concerns include privacy, security, and reliability. The survey shows that organizations are beginning to take steps to mitigate these risks. So Trevor, tell me, what ways have you seen companies manage risk when using AI internally at their businesses? So we've seen AI go, go mainstream, especially with the advent of ChatGPT and OpenAI. And, you know, you're looking at infinite possibilities from infinite amounts of data. But I think top of mind for most of our clients who happen to be, you know, folks in the security business like, like uh, Brian's old company, Armis, uh, folks like GitHub, you know, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, yeah, GitHub and Microsoft does use us. Uh, Lenovo just went with us over ChatGPT. Uh, so we've got, we've got large companies and small companies, but I think the underlying team is they want to ensure that they're protecting their IP. They want to make sure that IP stays within the four walls of the enterprise, right? Yeah. So when you look at ChatGPT and we look at Llama 2 or any of the open source models, they're really exciting, right? Because at the end of the day, what it is is these models are think like human beings based on neural networks. So we love that, right? But, but the fact of the matter is, you want to make sure that your IP stays within your company. So what we've gone with the strategy is a hybrid model. And what I mean by a hybrid model is, we leverage the strength of large language models um, in what we call small selective models that are trained on your IP and your data and stay within the enterprise. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a context, which is really important because anything without context results in what we call hallucinations you know, and other kinds of stuff, right? Or stochastic, what they call stochastic parrot, where it sounds really authoritative, but really it's, it's not really answering the question, right? It's false information. So with, with, that, with that in mind, we've seen um, tremendous response. We've got about 93% adoption of Mickey, uh, which is our machine intelligence and knowledge user interface. And um, you know, we're very excited. Uh, we've now embarked on doing what, what I call AI um, automated workflows, where we use multiple AI agents uh, akin to the matrix, to go in and automate about 90% of the work you do on a daily basis. And what that does for you is it allows you to liberate your inner Einstein or your inner, I'm not going to say Elon Musk, but maybe your inner Steve Jobs, you know, and, uh, and really focus on, on being a better version of yourself and, and being more productive. And, uh, you know, I think Brian can speak, speak more to it, right? So. Yeah, I think, I think any organization right now is concerned about the use and misuse of AI within their organizations. And I think it's very important for companies to recognize that and start enablement programs and train their employees on how best to be able to work with AI as it's coming into organizations, whether it's within their own product or external products that are being used. So I think enabling companies and their employees is really top of mind and that's what should be done right now. Now, Brian, you recently joined Dataminer as the president and COO. What attracted you to Dataminer? Yeah, so I had an opportunity to sit down with Ted, Ted Bailey, and I know Judy, you just uh, interviewed him here, and um, just a wonderful guy, big heart, brilliant mind, and I was blown away, kind of stopped in my tracks with what Dataminer is doing. And for me, Dataminer has completely transformed the future of real-time information by utilizing and combining the power of AI with real-time publicly available data sources. And our AI platform can predict events, risks, and threats, and even the news at scale globally, tapping into over a million publicly available data sources, and then using generative AI to allow our employees to understand as an event is transforming, but more importantly, as that event is evolving. So when I sat down with him, I knew I wanted to be part of a company on a mission and one that's going to change the world. That's incredible, Brian. I mean, um, well, first of all, congratulations. I mean, CEO and president. Thank you, thank you. You scaled the business at Armist to over 200 million, and I'm sure you're gonna take, um, take data miner to, shall we say a billion? IPO, Absolutely. right? Yeah. I'm not setting, I'm not setting the, the bar too low, <laughs> considering you are who you are. So talk yeah. to me, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, right? Uh, having scaled Armist, uh, when I heard you guys, you guys are talking about RevGen AI, RevGen AI. Yeah. Talk to me about RevGen AI and how that's impacting uh, either your customers and, and the company, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so data miners have always been on the forefront of AI before AI was even AI. You know, we started the company uh, 14 years ago, and one of the first things that we built was something called multimodal fusion AI, and that was the power to take data that we would get from video, from voice, from text, images, sensors, 
and take that information and be able to store it. Um, and then we really worked with the generative AI side to take that information and turn it into text and something that somebody could read and then take action upon. Now think about this, like the regenerative AI is the next thing that we're pioneering. It has just come out. And if you're an organization, I know both of you have used ChatGPT, but think about how that works. What you do is you ask a question or you initiate a prompt, you get a response. And every time you want a new answer, you have to go back in and ask another question. Once you ask the question with Data Miner, you're getting the regenerative AI format back to you. So a news story is evolving in text before your eyes without you having to ask another question. So amazing. it's completely amazing and transformative. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that, that's just mind blowing. I mean, looking at Sora and looking at some of the stuff that ChatGPT's come up, but this takes it to the next level. I and and ChatGPT and other tools are not in real time. They go yeah. back in a certain period of time yeah. in history. Yeah, there's always a latency, right? There's always yeah. latency, yeah. correct. Yeah. Now, how did you get here? Did you build it? Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, we did. Uh, like, like I mentioned, 14 years ago, we came out with the technology. And then 12 years ago, when we started getting all of this data from public sources, we started to record it. So we've got a 12 year history of recording every event, incident, news story that has happened. So that else actually helps us with predictive analytics. Um, but uh, we now have the ability, we've built 50 large language models in 150 languages. I just got back from RSA. And you walked the, which is by the way, the largest cybersecurity conference in the world. And you walk on the trade, on the floor there and you see a lot of companies in their booths and everybody's saying that they're doing AI. It's a new buzzword. And, and it's important for companies to embrace AI to propel their companies forward. But a lot of companies utilize other companies' AI sources through APIs to be able to get that information, but not us. It's our own, we built it from scratch and we're very proud of that. And that's what makes us very unique. Incredible. Well, I mean, building it organically um, on your own stack has its, has its obviously advantages, right? In terms of security profile, et cetera. Right. Having come from Arbis, when I heard about your cybersecurity offering, I wasn't exactly surprised it wasn't that shattering. So talk to me more about your cybersecurity offering uh, in terms of, I mean, you talked about being an RSA, right? Yeah. And as you know, um, I'm a math geek. So the Riemann hypothesis is the holy grail of mathematics uh, around prime numbers, you know, the zeta function, with negative integers, et cetera. And of course, the, this, this overlying fear at RSA, which you probably heard about, with the fact that with generative AI, the ability to basically co-locate where new prime numbers are, you can es essentially take you know, public encryption and break it down, right? Public encryption, if you look at it, the encrypting key is 10 to the power of 600, while the decrypting keys are 10 to the power of 300 times twice, right? So talk to me about what you guys are coming out with it and how you're dealing with this, with this excitement, but also, I think, fear in terms of the potential of generative AI, but also the impact it potentially have on security and ancillary offerings, right? Yeah, so I mean, fundamentally, what we're gonna be doing is taking the same guiding principles that have made us successful in the physical security world and early warning detection and doing the same thing in cyber. Now imagine us also combing the dark web and the deep facets of the world to be able to discover where the events are actually starting or the risks and threats. And we've thought about this from a cyber perspective and broke it down into four categories. And the first is around digital risk and specifically around ransomware attacks. And we'll have the ability to see not only where an attack is about to launch, but as it evolves and who's actually behind it and be able to have the early warning detection, which will only help companies and their peers before they get attacked by ransomware. Next is third party risk and helping organizations and partners <coughs> also understand how they can rent prevent against uh, DDoS attacks, fraud detection, website defacement, and those types of things. Uh, the third is vulnerability management, having the opportunity to take an industry that quite frankly hasn't evolved much in the last two decades, but have the ability to not only recognize a threat, but be able to look at it and see how it's changing and evolving as it's moving across the world and propagating. And then lastly, it's that convergence between physical security and cybersecurity, bringing that together as there's a convergence of IT and OT and making sure that we look at that holistically as it actually is, a, is uh, working with supply chain. Oh, this is incredibly exciting. I mean, yeah. when I heard you going to data miner and I was reading up with you guys, and then we spoke after that. And I mean, just in terms of, you know, the ability to be able to predict nationwide risk or nationwide change, I mean, large line, take, taking these models of yours and going to Saudi Arabia or you know, looking at the impact of the Middle East and all, or oil prices or 
or the financial markets moving, if you're able to actually predict, you know, where this risk is going to come from is, I mean, it's just mind boggling, right? So. Yeah, that's a good point, Trevor. Thanks. All right. Now we're going to hear from both of you. Yeah. Um, Brian, tell me, what is your favorite way to use AI? Okay. Personally. Personally. Okay. So there's, uh, there's probably two things that come to mind. And the first thing is the queen of AI products, which is Alexa. And the way that we use Alexa at home is my five-year-olds. I mean, they've been using it since they could talk. And what's really unique about Alexa, she's learned their voices over time and it's gotten better. And they're asking questions. Their little inquisitive minds are always using her. And uh, so I think that's probably the most used um, in our household. Um, for me, I was able to get my hands on a super cool technology called um, Music LM. It was, uh, it's published by Google. And imagine having the ability as somebody writing music or even DJing to put into text what you want to hear. And then the program coming back and writing and composing a song based on your criteria. It's so much fun to play around with and it's in absolutely incredible. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna be hearing some music from you then. Oh yeah. That's like that's my uh, <laughs> there you go. You know, that's my retirement plan. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. How about you, Trevor? I mean, you know, I live and breathe AI every day, right? Um, but most of it will be B2B perspective in terms of, um, you know, what's coming next? How can I improve impact productivity, you know, at Brian's old company, Carmis, and hopefully now at Data Miner, or all of some of the largest customers we have in the world, like Lenovo, et cetera. What's coming next and how can I really help them? And what do we need to be aware of? But at the end of the day, on a personal basis, Alexa, of course, I've been using it ever since it first came out. I'm a complete geek. I've been using audiovisual from Apple, of course, and looking at new ways in which um, you know, we can leverage AI with there from an audiovisual perspective. So that's pretty exciting. And then, um, you know, I write poetry. So I think what, you know, I've always been a geek in terms of, you know, Shakespeare and, you know, uh, and then of course, you know, Midsummer's Night Dream, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to play around and, and, and take stuff from Midsummer's Night Dream or, you know, uh, Roman Juliet, scene three, act four, or she that teaches the to be bright, the beauty hangs upon the cheek of night, et cetera, et cetera. And I like to use ChatGPT or Llama too and see how they recreate it in their own version of, of Shakespeare. I know that sounds corny, but those are things that, things that kind of keep me up at night. Or, you know, I mean, I try stuff like the Riemann's hypothesis, the holy grail of math. And I say, I assume that Riemann's hypothesis is right. What does it really do to the encryption keys? So those kinds of things. But it's just so exciting, you know, the ways in which, you know, you can take uh, generative AI as exists today in the direction you can, right? So. Trevor, you're not a level. <laughs> he really is. He really is. It's awesome. All right. Well, it's been wonderful to talk with you both. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Judy. It's a pleasure.